everyone. My name is Sarah Lakin. I'm the Director of Business Development and Partnerships for the National Math and Science Initiative. So glad to have you joining us for today's conversation. I am very excited to introduce Dr. Frederick Bertley, um, who is a scientist, a scholar, um, and currently the President and CEO of the si Center for um, Science and Industry of COSI uh, in Columbus, Ohio. We are thrilled to have him here today. Um, he's going to be taking part in our conversation, moderated by Taylor Alston of Nimsy, and so sit back, enjoy, um, ask questions. The chat is being moderated. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. And Dr. Bertley, we're just so thrilled to have you with us today. Um, as a friend and former colleague, um, I'm excited to know what you have to say um, to folks out there today and, and to keep us all motivated during these trying times. So Taylor, I will turn it over to you. Um, Dr. Bertley, welcome. Um, thank you. Thank you again for joining us. Got it. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, Dr. Bartley. I'm so excited to get to know more about you and to, and to be the one asking you all the, the heavy hitting questions today. So um, I am a member of the NIMSI team. I work with the National Math and Science Initiative as the, the Senior Director of Coach Development, and I'm thrilled to be talking to you today. So I just figured we'd start out uh, for the audience, Dr. Bartley, just giving them a little bit about your origins. Like if you could just share with us, you know, what you enjoyed about STEM in your youth that may have eventually led you to this work and just share with us a little bit about how you got to be Dr. Frederick Bertley. Sure, well, first of all, thank you again for having me part of this program, I'm really honored. Um, so for all disclosure, I'm born and raised in Montreal, Canada, so I'm Canadian, um, but I was raised by West Indian parents. Um, my mom was from Barbados and my dad was from Trinidad. And, you know, you growing up in Montreal, um, being a person of color, I, I, I thought I was gonna either be the next, you know, Drake or Jay-Z, or maybe have a career in, in basketball or something. And strangely enough, I got into hockey. And I really thought I was going to be a professional hockey player for the Montreal Canadiens. Um, didn't have nearly that talent, but as a kid, you didn't realize that. So I was like, I want to be a professional hockey player. Um, fast forward, um, actually, and I'm going to get a prop because I have it here. So for you younger people in the audience, this, I don't know if you can see it, is oh there you go you recognize that <laughs> so this is one of the first handheld video games it was made by a company called Coleco this was head-to-head -head football and again my parents were you know from the Caribbean I had a paper route the paper route was my paper route technically it was my money but West Indian parents don't play that so that money has to go into the bank all the time but I begged them I begged them please let me buy this game please and they finally let me buy the game I'm nine years old bought the game and then it takes you know those square batteries and, and, you know, again, for the younger people in, in the audience, not energy efficient, you'd go through these square batteries real quick. And uh, I couldn't afford to keep replacing the batteries. So I did what I thought was a, was a great idea, Taylor. I, I went into the basement, I found an old lamp, I cut off the cable of the lamp, I attached it to the red and black wires here, right in the back of the game. I plugged it into the wall, best 10 seconds of my life. <laughs> I was playing this game and I was so excited because I thought I solved all the problems for my energy for my battery. The 11 second, poof, the outlet, charred all around the outlet, my game that I loved exploded and my dad comes running down the stairs. Now, my dad had been in Canada for over 30 years at this point in time. He did not have a Caribbean accent unless he was upset. And he's like, son, what are you doing? You're trying to break the, trying to burn down the house. And I was like, no, um, but all jokes aside, my parents were supportive, but, but the moral here, is for me, that was my very first aha moment, where this thing that as a kid I took for granted called electricity, that you flick on a light switch or you plug something in the wall, that there's something magical or mystical happening behind that wall. And I was so curious. And that got me hooked on science and technology. And since then, the rest is history. Um, my, my, I did math in undergrad, math and physiology. Then I did my PhD in the immune system actually coincidentally studying viral immunopathogenesis and vaccines for viruses, which up until this year wasn't super useful and now it's unbelievably relevant. Um, but then I made the, so I've always loved science, but then I made the transition from being a science researcher. I worked at places at Harvard Medical School as part of a research team there. That was really fun. But then I jumped to the science museum world. And I did that because even though I like research kind of at the cutting edge, if you will, you're in a very small lab, you know, just a few of other people. But when you're in a science museum or out in the public, you get to access many more people. And so I'm passionate about science literacy and working at a science museum, first the Franklin Institute, and now COSI in Columbus, Ohio has been absolutely amazing. But it all comes that. back, 
it all comes back to blowing up this game. It's all about ColecoVision. It always is, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I love Absolutely. that. I love that something is as every day as a video game sparked your interest and drove what eventually would be your life's work. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about that life's work a little bit. Let's unpack that. Tell us more about your work. Um, how are you leveraging STEM to impact your community and also increase student um, access? Yeah, you know, so, so I mean, first of all, it's a great question. And, and I love that you talked about community, engaging the community and student access. Because a lot of times we look at them differently. Oh, we got to impact the K through 12 space, which we do. And there's a lot of work we can do there with teachers and, of course, students. But a lot of America, unfortunately, like a lot of Canada and even Europe, is, is very science illiterate, you know, and it's, it's, it's for me, it's personally upsetting. I mean, we're expected to read. If you couldn't read or I couldn't read, you'd be embarrassed. I'd be embarrassed. We're illiterate. Our families would be embarrassed for us. If you went to the store and bought something and couldn't count your change, you know, your family's embarrassed for you again and your friends like, wow, there's shame attached to that. But for some reason in this great country, you don't know anything about science? It's okay. In fact, you can say, oh, I'm not a nerd, you know, and it's almost a badge of honor. And that's crazy because science is everywhere. You cannot wake up and audience, please try, tell me if you can do this Tuesday. See if you can wake up Tuesday morning and get throughout the day without specifically being impacted by science technology. And by the way, I'm not even talking about the coronavirus. So pre-pandemic, uh, you know, as soon as we roll out of bed to see what our president tweeted, you know, technology, science made this happen. The food we eat, whether you like it or not, has been genetically modified. And I'm talking about your canned pasta as well, not the typical things you think. You know, this, this super, okay, it's not really expensive, but it's really nice ja jacket I'm wearing. Material engineers have spent a lot of money and time thinking about how to make it stain resistant. You know, when you drive your car, you use something called GPS, et cetera. It's everywhere. And so back to your point, it's not just for the kiddos in the K through 12 space, but we got to get adults to be excited again and engaged around science. It doesn't mean they have to be a PhD scientist. That's not the point. But the point is, just like you should learn to read and write, you should learn some basic science stuff and have a comfort and familiarity around it. Absolutely. Um, tell me, you, the, you have a passion for this, right? And we know that traditionally STEM has not been a very diverse place to, to move and, and, and um, explore as a person of color. Um, can you, can you tell me a little bit about your work in, in the sense of uh, the importance of representation in STEM, especially being a man of color in the yeah. STEM space? And, and how does your work address supporting access and equity um, in STEM education for people of color specifically? Absolutely. So first of all, thank you for that question, because now that's near and dear to my heart. Um, so again, I'm a, I'm a PhD scientist in vaccine development, and I specifically worked on HIV vaccines. Why did I go there, right? I went there because coming out of undergrad and then doing grad work and doing immunology, then boom, this whole pandemic HIV thing was there. It's a big thing. But when you look at HIV, you know, literally 95% of the people dying from this are in Africa, right? I mean, we're, we're good now in this country. You can take, if you have HIV, you can take one pill a day and live pretty much a normal life, which is great. I'm glad we have therapy, but we still don't have a vaccine for HIV. And so in Africa, it's still killing people by millions, right? And when I looked at that, I was like, okay, this is interesting. The lion's share of the people being affected like this look like me, but the people who are doing the research, and I wanna be clear, they're amazing scientists, regardless of color, you can be white male and be a great scientist trying to change the world. So I'm not saying, but I am saying if there's no person of color doing that kind of research, it's impacting everybody of color, Where's the cultural competency? Where's the cultural sensitivity, et cetera, et cetera. So, and that's actually really relevant to today when people are all talking about the vaccine, should I take this vaccine for COVID or not? And you know, a lot of black and brown people, rightly so, have their fears of you know, historical realities that this great country has done to us from slavery to the Tuskegee experiment to Henrietta Laxell's to you name it. So a lot of us are like, yeah, I'm skeptical, fine, but be part of the solution. That's why that, that young lady, this is African-American, female um, scientist who's part of the vaccine group is so encouraging. So so one, that was my specific journey. And that's why I picked something like HIV to be, you know, I'm only one, but to be part of that. I mean, we go to conferences and I'd never see anybody look like me. Fast forward to today. So now we operate for the last 12 years. I created this program called the Color of Science. And as the name suggests, it's a very simple concept. All scientists, I hate to break it out to you audience, all scientists, aren't all old white men with thick glasses and pocket protectors. Women make fantastic scientists and engineers and so do persons of color. And so the color science program is all about illuminating Taylor, shining a light on these men and women, 
And I want to be clear, I'm not flying in Neil deGrasse Tyson or, or Marie Curie from the grave. We're bringing people who are living in our communities. Every single community, if they have universities, guess what? They have black and brown scientists, but we just don't know that. Uh, and they have a great women, you know, a whole bunch of amazing women engineers. We just don't know that. And so the purpose of that is to celebrate it. And I coincidentally have our latest creation, which is these little passports. And these passports go into, we have a bigger science kit. So we have a science kit for nature, a science kit for space. This is for kind of um, elementary and middle school up to grade eight. Um, and so all these different topics, dinosaurs, water, but each kit now has a passport. And in the passport are all these amazing scientists of color. So now kiddos across the country are getting this kit and they can look in and they can see women, scientists, women engineers, black and brown folks, people from the LGBTQ community. They're all amazing scientists. And so, so that's really, that's our big program that we do to really showcase the beautiful diversity in science and technology. And that's great work. That's amazing work. And I know that that kind of representation helps us to change and shift, right? Who, who sees themselves in the, in the STEM careers and, and, and space and such important work. Um, you mentioned your background um, and I'd love to know and dig into that vaccine, right? All that knowledge that you have about it in this time and space. And let's speak to the obvious, right? Like, mm -hmm. Life has changed, the world has changed because of COVID-19. And I'm curious how your work specifically may have been affected by COVID-19. And even more specifically, has the pandemic provided you a greater opportunity perhaps to share the value of your work or maybe even connect with students and families in a different way? Yeah, I mean, absolutely on all fronts. So first of all, on the literal front, we're a science museum, um, right? And, and it's fun to say in February of 2020, so actually a year ago, um, USA Today ranked COSI, Center of Science and Industry, the number one science museum in the United States of America. So yeah. we, Taylor, we were on a high. Yeah. One month later, we're the number one science museum in the nation that's closed, <laughs> right? And so, and, and unfortunately, we've been closed since then. We wanted to open up earlier, but then they started to, the, the, the counts, the viral counts started to, to rise dramatically here in, in Columbus, so we decided not to open. So we've been closed. So on a literal front, the pandemic, like so many other industry sectors, so many other individuals, dramatically impacted our, our experience and our business model. And that included, you know, unfortunately having to transition some of the team members, furloughing some of the team members. Um, the flip side of that, though, is it did provide an opportunity because I went from being kind of a president CEO who's running a science museum to out there on a lot of public service networks and doing a lot of different outreach on TV, radio interviews all around the pandemic and around specifically the immunology leading up to it. And then now the vaccines and what are the vaccines about and how we should think about that. And I think that's really important. And I feel privileged to do that because I luckily have had the good fortune of wearing two hats, right? I'm a scientist, so I know I can talk, you know, deep details to exactly how the Pfizer, Moderna, the Johnson's and Johnson's and AstraZeneca vaccine work down to details. But I'm also working at a science center, so I know how to communicate this with the average person to not intimidate them, but get them to see it, as opposed to the scientists parachuting in and saying, take this because you're going to take it or die. Right. And, and so so that's been really useful and interesting as well. And then since then, we've also launched a program, a television program working with PBS and WSU. It's the first primetime TV show with the Science Museum and a PBS affiliate. And it's called QED with Dr. B and what it is. And I can play you the two minute trailer if you want later. If I can share my screen. But what it is is a science show to really break down science. And last week's episode was on viruses and coronavirus and all that. So yes, you know, I'm I'm still bummed that we're closed, but absolutely, um, absolutely a thrill to be just one of many spokespersons for 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 the science of coronavirus and just understanding the vaccine and and, and you know to get people comfortable to at least understand it. Yeah, um, your experience and Sarah only gave a small version because I know you didn't want a big introduction and like a reading of your bio, but I do want to point out that um, you have two uh, awards sitting on your bookshelf behind you. Um, I do believe that they look like Emmys. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so, so for, all, for, all, for, 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 for full disclosure, th they are Emmys. And they're full legit Emmys. The reason why they're on my shelf is because we actually, as I mentioned, we're doing that show, that filming of QED with Dr. B. And a lot of the filming are done by Zoom just because we can't be there in person. And so believe it or not, welcome to television world. I didn't know this folks. They came into my office and they're like, wait a minute, what are those things in the boxes under the table? I was like, oh, those are Emmys. They're like, what? 
you got to put them on the shelf. Like we got, so that's why they're there. Um, but they are Emmys. But the reason why I am proud of them is because, especially when I'm trying to mentor younger folks and get them excited about, hey, the, the joys of pursuing science, is I also say that you don't have to give up what you're passionate about. So if you're going to be the next Beyonce or you got flow like Lil Wayne, hey, that's great. If you got a killer crossover on the basketball court or you're a figure skater, that's fantastic. But if you love science, you can still do science as well. And so by having the Emmys, especially the younger folks, they're like, Dr. B, you got an Emmy? I was like, yeah, and I'm a scientist geek. How about that? And then, and then they're like, oh, that's actually kind of cool. And they get it. So, so that's why they're there. But yeah, they're for two different, I won two Emmys for two different films I produced a long time ago. So I just wanted to point them out because I know that you wouldn't brag on them yourself, but just, it's just another facet, right? To, to show children and, and those that are interested in STEM careers that it's not in a box. And no. I think that that's, I think you highlight that. And I'm sure a third Emmy will be coming along very soon. <laughs> well, thank you for the confidence. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Um, so I'll keep going though with my line of questioning, but I just wanted to make sure that we highlighted that. Um, what's next for your organization? You've talked about the pivot with COVID-19 and how that has probably maybe shifted the trajectory for the work that, that COSI's doing. And so I'm curious, what's next for your organization? What does the next version 2.0 or 6.0 or whatever version look like next? You got it. And if I, I'm going to try to share my screen to briefly answer that. So let me okay. see if this works. Okay. All right. Can you all see my screen? Yes. All right. So hopefully you can tell me if you can hear this when it plays. Science okay. is for everyone. It's everywhere, even when we aren't aware of it. Considering that science is all around us all the time, why don't we recognize science and talk about science every there Can you guys hear, I just wanna make sure, can you guys hear this? Yes, we could, we could hear it. And now it just started to show it right when you click something. Science okay. How about now? is for everyone. It's everywhere, even when we aren't aware of it. Considering that science is all around us all the time, why don't we recognize science and talk about science every day? Why are so many of us intimidated? Well, we are so gonna change that. Hi, I'm Dr. Frederick Bertley, President and CEO of Columbus, Ohio's Center of Science and Industry. I'm also a scientist, educator, who specializes in immunology. And now I'm teaming up with WOSU Public Media for a brand new primetime TV science series called QED with Dr. B. From small innovations to big discoveries, in our new series, we'll show you that it's all quite easily demonstrated. Together, we'll reveal the science in the everyday. Want to see some examples? You got it. How about nanotechnology? Materials and devices built on the scale of atoms and molecules that can transform our very health and the environment. Or how weather forecasts are dependent on commercial airline traffic. Or artificial intelligence that helps to supply energy during natural disasters. And of course, we'll keep you up to date with the latest advances on the coronavirus pandemic that has changed our lives dramatically. Look cool? We'll take you into state-of-the-art labs performing cutting-edge research. We'll bring the newest discoveries down to earth. And we'll talk to everyday scientists who are charting new frontiers, answering today's questions, and solving problems to make all of our lives better. Right now and for years to come. When a scientist or mathematician demonstrates a proof of concept, they often use the term QED, quad erat demonstratum, that roughly translates into quite easily demonstrated. Join me for QED with Dr. B. QED with Dr. B is a co-production of WOSU Public Media and COSI. So, I don't know if that, hopefully that played. Yes, it did. So, so it's funny you asked what's, what's next, what's the 2.0 version of COSI? You know, like many other folks, the pandemic shut us down. And so we have to get creative to think about how are we gonna sustain ourselves? And more importantly, not just sustain ourselves financially, but how are we gonna be relevant? How are we gonna have an impact, right? You talked earlier and I loved how you put an impact for the education space, but also the community. We take that seriously. And so what do you do for your science museum that can't physically open, right? So we launched these things called these kits that I alluded to earlier. 
these are these boxes that have all this great content. We got five and we're building another five. Again, it could go, we actually are going down to pre-K. So now we have pre-K to eight. And these are things that have five different hands-on experiments. And so you can do an experiment every day or you can use one experiment for the whole week. But the point is everything to do the science experiment is in the box and we can ship it to you in your classroom or you at home. And so it's a way of COSI having a science literacy impact or an educational experience for kiddos at home. The other thing is this show. Right? So the show is not bounded by our building being closed. It's a television show. And not only are we going to have a primetime television show, but we're going to have um, digital assets, so cut down versions, and we're creating a bunch of educational tools, not just for kiddos, but for adults as well, to, as they watch the show and they want to learn more on cool cutting edge science topics, they can. And so those are just some of the things that we're trying to do that are kind of um, pandemic proof, if you will, because they're building independent. I love the model, the, the QED with Dr. B, the science kits, right? There's more different ways that you're exploring as, at COSI to, to really get deeper into the community, even through a pandemic. Yep. Um, so through all of these initiatives, what, what's the call to action, Dr. B? <laughs> what, what is I, the I love that. call to action? The, the call to action is science is everywhere and science is for everyone. Therefore, us at COSI, we got programming for you from the womb to the tomb, and we'll bring something to where you live, learn, and lounge. So that's the call to action, to really understand that it doesn't matter gender, it doesn't matter orientation, it doesn't matter of race, it doesn't matter of age. Science is for everyone, and so we are part of that ecosystem to help make science fun, engaging, and accessible. I love that call to action. It's for, science is for everyone. Yep. How would you support families and caregivers how do we how do we engage families and caregivers and communities in that call to action i love that you said that so one of the other i mean i can go on for days of all the things that we're doing differently because of the pandemic another thing we're doing is these kits we first were like how do we get stuff for kiddos at home you know to prevent some of the sliding that's happening between those who can't be in school especially the underserved populations they're sliding back even further so that was the first point of that but then we learned that the kiddos at home, whether it was their mom, their dad, their grandparent, or whoever the elder was in the house, that it helped them connect more with the kid because they were doing the stuff together. So we've then reached out and we've gone from not just impacting the K through 12 space, but now we're engaging in social services. So think about this, we're a science museum, but now we're working with people from recovering houses. We're working with people in homeless shelters. We're working with the foster care system. And all these kiddos and parents are actually using their kits to help better connect with their family. And so. You know, we didn't wake up, you know, or when I first came here, we weren't thinking that, wow, COSI is a science museum. We're going to have an impact in these social services. But because of the creativity of our team, and I got to give all the credit to the team, they're just fantastic. We're able to have these resources that go beyond the typical science museum outreach to that family that can come buy a ticket. But we have stuff for everybody, cross community, cross sector, and cross um, discipline. I love that. I think that's our work to support um, students and are, is strengthened by leveraging the collective impact of local organizations. And that's what community building is, right? And so I love Absolutely. that. You know, like we would never typically go and, and work with social workers, but this is the work, this is how the work has changed, right? Yeah, this absolutely. It's needed more than ever, frankly. Absolutely. Um, I don't remember the quote, but what is it like? Innovation comes from a need, right? That's right. That's Basically. right. That's right. <laughs> the basic premise of the quote. Um, so a few more questions, because I'm just really enjoying this conversation so much, Dr. I feel like I just need to call you Dr. B now, because keep me <laughs> You can call me Frederick. But... It's stuck now, <laughs> Frederick. Um, so we spoke a bit about the call to action, but there is, you know, there's still this gap. And so for students and young STEM professionals that are interested in getting into STEM and are seeking opportunities outside of that, what you spoke in traditional space, right? Um, or pathways of medicine, research, or engineering, what are some ways, what are some advice that you would give to young professionals, how they can, how they can explore and, and what they might like do to pique their interest and get their step in the door STEM? Yeah, I, I love that question. So thank you for asking that. Um, so first of all, I'll use myself as an example. So my parents were lovely and, you know, I love them dearly. Um, but what I've learned in my life is when you're interested in something, first of all, don't let people tell you it's not cool. If you're passionate about something, you're passionate about it. I know it's hard. We want to be what's trendy and cool and what's hip. At the end of the day, if you're really excited about something, and if that something is something science, technology, engineering, math, wear that as a badge of honor and be proud. Secondly, and most importantly, they are people that love the fact that you're excited about STEM. 
Yes, there's a lot of people blocking here and there, or they can be, but there are a lot of people like the people I'm interviewing right now, like the people part of this organization, and throughout society, if you're excited about an engineering field, find an engineer, and I guarantee you, you could cold email any engineer or scientist and say, hi, I'm Frederick Bertley, I'm in grade nine, or I'm a sophomore in college or whatever, you know, I want to learn a little bit more about discipline, nine out of 10 will respond to you and be happy to talk to you. And that's the thing that's interesting. And it gets back to your point, Taylor, about, you know, now more than ever, we need to bring community and work together. If you're interested, you will find an adult, a professional in that space that's been doing that. And he or she, again, nine times out of 10, every now and then you get somebody like, I'm just super busy. But nine times out of 10, they will respond to you and they will help you. And whether they can answer your specific question, if they can't, they'll bring another colleague in. That colleague's gonna give you an internship over the summer. Now you're in this lab doing chemistry and you had no idea you could do this and you're doing it. I mean, it just, don't be shy. Bring your questions out there. People will answer your call. I can tell you, I've been doing this for years now and scientists and engineers always say, Frederick, I wanna help. I just don't know how to help. Um, can you get me a young person to help? And so they're out there waiting. That's so true. The, the doors are there. You just gotta knock sometimes, right? Absolutely. And you gotta step through it. You got to be willing to step through it. Yep. Um, so speaking of that professional kind of launch pad um, for young people and young professionals, what are some ways that young professionals can contribute to their communities at a time when they might just be starting in their careers and families? Yeah, so so and I say this respectfully, if you're if you're young starting out in your career, you have to take care of yourself. So so you know, work hard at your job. You know, there's always time to volunteer as you move on. Make sure you're doing as good as you can do in your job and taking care of your, your immediate situation. But once you find out you have a little bit of wiggle room or time, nonprofit worlds love volunteers. So whether that's the zoo, whether that's a science museum like us, whether that's the botanical gardens, um, whether, and you can, you can go into the art side, whether it's the art museum, these kinds of institutions, your local boys and girls club, YMCA, they always want volunteers. So if you're saying, if you're, you know, you're starting off in your career, but you have some volunteer time, people will absolutely take you. And what's really cool is these volunteer experiences are so fulfilling. You know, you might volunteer one hour a week or, or two hours a month, but I can tell you, you'll be so fulfilled by that volunteering piece because it's meaningful. It, the people are benefiting from your skill set and interests and your experience and you're sharing it with, with other people usually younger people to motivate them so that's my recommendation again knock on doors people will happily open and answer absolutely and i think that through volunteering exposure happens right that you may that's be right. exposed to something you didn't even know was out there that's um, actually that's a really good point i want thanks for saying that because not only are you putting yourself out there and meeting usually like mentoring or influencing a younger person but you're also meeting the leadership at those institutions you're meeting sometimes board members at those institutions. And you might be a young engineer, young scientist, or a young artist by volunteering, but now you met this big muckety muck that can help to further propel you in your career. So absolutely, Taylor, that's a great point. Very true. Um, so speak, staying on this, on this line, how would you address or advise young professionals who aren't certain they have valuable contributions to make to their communities? Here, here's the short answer to that. There are 7.7 .7 billion people on planet Earth. With the exception of the few identical twins out there, each of us are different. All of us have something to offer. So um, if you're interested in volunteering or you're interested in supporting, I guarantee you, whatever makes you you, there is something there that you can offer and share with somebody else that'll have a positive impact in their life. So it's not, oh, I'm the greatest engineer, or I started Facebook, I'm Mark Zuckerberg, therefore I can have the influence. No, it doesn't matter what you do. If you're interested and you have a passion to help, I guarantee you there's something in your makeup, a combination of who you are as a person and whatever skills you've developed over time. And by the way, we all have skills, whether that's braiding extensions and that's really cool, or that's something else. We have a lot of skills and talent within us. You can share that and you can help people. I love that, Dr. Dr. Burley. That's amazing advice to give to young folks out there that are seeking to make an impact in their communities. Those are all of my questions that I have for you in this, this very fun interview that I've enjoyed so much. I just want to open it now to see if there is, when you think about the legacy, the, you know, that call to action, there, is there anything else that you would love to share with folks out on Facebook? Live yeah, well, Miss Austin, and I'm calling you Miss Austin because you're referring to me as Dr. Bertley, so <laughs> I'm calling you Miss Austin. Um, you know, yes, there is. There, there, there are three things I want to mention. 
we went through or still going through rather the me too movement we are still going through the black lives matter movement and we're still going through the pandemic these are three kind of transformational things that you know on the one hand the pandemic is terrible that we're going through that on the other hand we are living in times that you know very other few people have lived in the history of their so so i just say that to say take stock of where we are like whatever age you are i don't care if you're middle school high school college i don't care if you're a grown adult working for 20 years think about the moment we're in and back to your point miss austin it's a moment that if we ever needed to understand three things the importance that um community is critical because mm. we can't get out of this ourselves mm -hmm. the importance that love and kindness versus meanness and hatred are critical and three science matters because if i got covid i want that that doctor that nurse to be giving me the best medicine that he or she got you know or i want the vaccine to prevent it or the communications that's required to network all these vaccines coming out from wherever they're coming out to get into the arms of people i mean there's so much technology and infrastructure that's under kind of pinned by science that we got to keep that critically in mind. And so, so my parting words are, um, I don't want to say enjoy the moment because there's nothing specifically to enjoy about the pandemic, but realize we are in a very special time in society and let's leverage that. And together through collaboration, we will get out of this and be better and stronger um, as opposed to if, um, you know, we're just going to continue to be the same old, same old. <laughs> I love that. I love you breaking it down to those three things. And to me, I feel like that's the best way to end this conversation. It's absolutely right. Science, science for the win. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm so absolutely. glad that you represent all things STEM. Um, I really enjoyed speaking to you, Frederick. This has been fun. I really appreciate you being a uh, game for letting us interview you today at National Math and Science Initiative. Your work, the work at COSI is just, um, it's, it's it's very um when i think about the next version when you were talking about the next version of it it's it feels right for right now but also right for the future yeah. um and it also feels like we're going to tap perhaps you know groups of people that we could not have tapped traditionally so yeah. i see only wonderful positive things coming out of these new ventures for you and so i definitely wish you all the luck Ms. Austin, i truly appreciate that um, it's been a pleasure to, to, to chat with you. The work that the National Math and Science Initiative is doing is phenomenal. Keep up the great work. Any way Frederick Bertley can help, any way COSI can help, please consider us a resource. I'm here to serve. So however else I can work with you all will be terrific. Thank you, Dr. Bertley. We're going to call it a wrap. There's no questions in the, in the chat. So I think everybody's just enjoying watching you. And um, I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. It was so nice to talk with you today. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Take care.